Welcome to part two of this Maritime Great Britain production of the life of Admiral Nelson. In July 1797, now a Rear Admiral of the Blue, Nelson was sent on a special mission to the island of Tenerife. In order to disrupt the Spanish war effort and thereby create a chance of peace with Spain, an attack was ordered on Santa Cruz. The intelligence said that the port was poorly defended and that there was a treasure ship moored there. To deprive the enemy of the port and the treasure would greatly weaken the Spanish position. And as reluctant allies of the French, the balance may be tipped in favor of the British. The first attempt at attack took place on the night of the 22nd of July, and despite all of the careful planning, the elements were against them. Adverse winds and strong currents swept the British away from the port. A further attempt was made later, but was fought off by the defending Spanish soldiers. Nelson took the decision to lead the last attack himself. The able Spanish commander, General Antonio Gutierrez, was well prepared. The attackers were cut down by cannon and musket fire and Nelson himself, when about to leave the boat that had carried him to the shore, was hit in the elbow by a musket ball. The Admiral was carried back to his flagship, where his right arm was amputated just above the elbow. After a long and painful recovery, Nelson was again ready to serve his king. In March 1798, he hoisted his flag aboard the Vanguard and set sail to rejoin Lord St. Vincent off the Spanish naval port of Cadiz. Intelligence had reached Lord St. Vincent that the French were on the move and in large numbers. What it hadn't told him was their destination. In command of the French operation was General Napoleon Bonaparte. His mission to invade Egypt and to travel overland to India in order to destroy British possessions in the east. Napoleon sailed on the 19th of May with nearly 40,000 troops aboard 400 transports, accompanied by 13 battleships. On the afternoon of the 1st of August, 1798, after months of searching, the enemy fleet was discovered at anchor in Abukir Bay, east of Alexandria. Despite the approaching night, Nelson attacked. Captain Thomas Foley of the Goliath realized as he approached the enemy that although the French were anchored in line close to the shore, they had left more than enough room for his ship to pass down their landward side. Taking the initiative, he steered Goliath between the shoreline and the enemy, catching them totally unprepared. Other British ships passed inside the line, while more concentrated on the seaward side, resulting in the French fleet being sandwiched by the British. Nelson, aboard the vanguard, watched as the inevitable began to unfold before him. His band of brothers took on ship after ship, moving down the French line. As the battle progressed, Nelson was wounded above his remaining good eye and feared that it was his end. Fortunately, the wound was not serious, and after receiving treatment, he was back on the quarterdeck of the vanguard in time to witness the spectacular final destruction of the French flagship Lorient. Although the victory at the Nile was total and on an unprecedented scale, the British fleet was by no means unscathed. Many ships were in urgent need of repair, and so the battered fleet made its way to the friendly port of Naples. The wounded Nelson aboard a wounded battleship slowly crept into Naples Harbour on the 22nd of September 1798. King Ferdinand IV, his Queen Marie Theresa, sister of the executed French Queen Marie Antoinette, and assorted dignitaries and officials rode out to meet the hero aboard his flagship. Perhaps the most remarkable welcome came from the wife of the British ambassador, Lady Emma Hamilton. Wearing a dress embroidered with Nelson's name, she collapsed in front of him and was heard to say, Oh God, is it possible? Her husband, Sir William Hamilton, reported, In short, no words can express what is felt here and the consequences of this action are incalculable. As Nelson recovered from his wound, he lived with the Hamiltons in their house. He also attended the numerous celebrations where the small seeds that would flourish into the romance between him and Lady Hamilton were being sown. This next period of Nelson's life is perhaps the most controversial. Historians still argue about the rights and wrongs of the decisions that Nelson made and the extent of his involvement in the atrocities that followed. In December 1798, French forces were rapidly approaching Naples and were poised to enter the city. Those inside either panicked, rioted or found their own revolutionary spirit and prepared the way for the French. As the safety of the royal family could no longer be assured, Nelson organized to have them transported to Palermo in Sicily. The French in Naples had not received much local support and their forces were in danger of collapse. 
The city was in turmoil as the separate factions fought for overall control. Representing the king was Cardinal Fabrizio Rufo, who had arrived back in Naples in February 1799. His mission was to organize the royalist support. The remaining republicans were now very vulnerable and were eventually forced to withdraw further and further. By June, Rufo's royalists had reached the inner city as the carnage was reaching its height. The republicans and the remaining French were forced to retreat into the fortresses of Uovo, Nuovo and St. Elmo. Meanwhile, outside the castle's walls, any citizen suspected of having sided with the French was slaughtered in the streets. An armistice followed and an agreement was made, orchestrated by Cardinal Rufo. The agreement was that those who wished it would be provided with safe passage to France and amnesty offered to those that wanted to stay. When the news of this truce reached King Ferdinand, he was outraged and refused to enter into any agreement with traitors. He demanded an unconditional surrender. Nelson acted according to the king's wishes and on returning to Naples took charge of the surrender, refusing to abide by the conditions agreed by Cardinal Rufo and countersigned by his own representative, Captain Foote, aboard the Seahorse. Following Nelson's conduct in Naples, further controversy was to follow, as Nelson disobeyed a direct order from his commander, Lord Keith, to send his squadron to protect the island of Minorca, one of the most important possessions in the Mediterranean. Nelson said, I have no scruple in deciding that it is better to save the Kingdom of Naples and risk Minorca. By April 1800, Nelson was again worn out and so wrote to his commander, My health is so very much impaired that a change of climate is absolutely necessary. I therefore request that you will allow of my going to England. After one last farewell cruise with the Hamiltons aboard Foudroyant, he left for England, but he was not to return alone. Nelson had been away from home and his wife since March 1798. In that time he had produced the greatest naval victory the world had ever known and become a hero on an unprecedented scale. But he had also become involved in a political controversy in Naples and now a very public affair with Lady Emma Hamilton. These next few months in Nelson's life must have been plagued by contrasting emotions. The woman he loved was now expecting his child. His wife and their situation had to be settled, and his relationship with his employers at the Admiralty had to be repaired.